Hi everybody, welcome to this week's Kefir 30, our 30-minute uh, 30 Bible study. And as you know, we're going through the Torah, and this week we'll be covering chapters 28 through 32. Uh, the Torah portion is called Vayetzi, Vayetzi, which literally means, and he went out. So before we jump in, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the Word, the Word of God. We thank you for what a gift it is to us, that you've given it to us in order to provide us direction and insight and to understand your heart. And so we just pray, Lord, that you give us courage and boldness to walk in your ways. Pray that there are lessons that you would have for us today we would be open to, that we would learn, and once again, that we would walk in them. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, get your Bibles. Get them open. We're going to be picking up the story now with uh, Jacob fleeing um, and heading to uh, Laban's. Uh, I, you know, I love the intro that my friend Moshe uh, wrote on his website, Sharshim regarding the uh, this, this Torah portion. He says, in the Torah portion of Genesis 28, we see Yaakov, or Jacob, fleeing from his home. He was escaping from a brother who was set to kill him. He was running from a father who may have lost some measure of faith and confidence in his son. Remember the deception? He was leaving without knowing when he was to return. And he was leaving into a, or heading to a land of the unknown and into a future filled with challenges and doubt. <clears throat> Excuse me, he goes on to say, it was this flight into exile and the accompanying sense of insecurity that become the shared experience of his descendants as they themselves would stumble from exile to exile. And the end ends with this. Jacob runs away feeling very unsure about himself and about his worthiness. I really believe that that does a great job in setting the stage. Sense of insecurity, a sense of unworthiness, not knowing exactly when, if ever, he would return. This is Jacob. Well, Bible's open, chapter 28. Just a reminder that uh, I don't go verse by verse. Uh, basically, I take the entire portion and see what jumps out at me, uh, along with the different people and brothers and sisters that that comment for Kafir, Andrew, and my wife Sharon, and Glenn, and Troy, they all have comments as well, which is why it's important for you to make sure that you access the PDF PowerPoint that accompanies this, because a lot of times I just, I, I want to keep it to 30 minutes, and so a lot of times I don't have enough time to give you all the insights, but the PDF PowerPoint does, okay? So, chapter 28, verse 10. Jacob went out from Beersheba. He went towards Haran, and he came to a certain place, and he stayed there all night because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place, and he put it under his head, lay down in that place to sleep. And then verse 12, he dreamed. And he saw a stairway set upon the earth, and its top reached to the heavens. Behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Stairway to heaven, right? Now, we know that this dream has an ultimate messianic application. And it's the reason why it's here for us. Jesus was humanly descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
He and he alone is our stairway to heaven that will provide us with the way to get down or provided a way for him to get down and for us to get up. He refers to himself as the true object of Jacob's dream. In John 1 verse 51, he says, Verily, truly, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the stairway to heaven. Verse 13, Behold, Yahweh stood above it, stairway, and said, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, I will give the land you lie on to you, to your offspring. Your offspring will be as the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. In you and in your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then verse 15, Behold, I am with you, I will keep you wherever you go, will bring you again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you. Now I'm going to rewind a bit and, and remind you of that intro that Moshe gave, that, that feeling of unworthiness, that feeling of insecurity and not knowing Notice how God addresses this. God gives to Jacob the same kind of promise that he gives to us in Philippians 1, verse 6, where it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus the Messiah. God won't let us go until this work is complete in us. Amen? Let, let's let some of this sort of sink in because I think we too have those sense of unworthiness and insecurity and wondering will we ever return and notice these promises that God gives. I will, I will, I will. I'll give you the land. Important to note, especially as we're looking at the world today, and, and there are those that would say, no, that Israel does not have the right to the mountains of Judea and Samaria. Wait a second. This is the word of God. And God says, I will give you the land. Bethel, right outside of Jerusalem, but in today's scenario, right in the West Bank. But God says it's mine and I give it to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, let's move to verse 16. Again, what an amazing picture here of, of Jacob. It says in verse 16 that Jacob awakened out of his sleep and he said, surely Yahweh is in this place. And I didn't know it. He was afraid, who wouldn't be? And he said, how awesome this place is. This is none other than God's house and this is the gate of heaven. Back to Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way to heaven. He doesn't show us a way. He is the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And then verse 18 says that Jacob rose early in the morning. He took the stone that he had put under his head. And he set it up for a pillar and he poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God. 
But the name of the city was Luz at first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace and Yahweh will be my God. Then this stone which I have set up for a pillar will be God's house. Of all that you will give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now this is very interesting. Um, I'll go into some detail of what's called the Zero Temple, our friend Eli Shukran, what he's discovered in the city of David. I again, uh, encouraging you to get the PDF because I have photos here of this. But let's back up a step. The, the city of Bethel, or Bethel, it plays an important, not always a glorious role in Israel's history. It is second only to Jerusalem in the number of times that it's mentioned in the Old Testament. Later, when speaking to Jacob, God actually refers to himself as the God of Bethel, Genesis 31, 13. God had appeared to Abraham near Bethel, and Bethel would eventually become, unfortunately, a high place notorious for idolatrous sacrifices. And again, those references are 1 Kings 13, 32, Hosea 10, 15, and Amos 4, 4. Now I've given you a map on this next slide in order for you to see the location of Bethel. As I mentioned, just north of Jerusalem, I've had the blessing of being able to be in this location in the West Bank. Uh, you'll see um, a memorial, a monument, uh, the remains of uh, a place in which there are those that would say this is the place where Jacob laid his head and had this vision, these photos you can see. But I'm going to bring something up, as I mentioned about Eli Shukron. This is some comments from uh, Troy Anderson, and he says in verse 22 of chapter 28, where he says, This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Troy writes, there are ruins at the city of David's archaeological site that indicate an earlier temple prior to the construction of Solomon's temple, where they found a pillar set up in the exact way that Jacob is describing here. I cannot describe what it's like to be in the land where the Bible stories took place and where the Jewish people have worshiped God and to experience the land that God calls his own. I want to encourage every follower of Jesus to experience his land for themselves. Well, I've been with Troy to this location in the city of David. In this next slide, you'll see that stone pillar that Eli Shukron has discovered, again, I'm talking about the city of David, just south of the Temple Mount. Let me read to you what Eli has to say about his discovery. He says that the pillar that's found in the city of David is just like the one described here in Genesis 28, where Jacob had a dream in Bethel of a ladder reaching up to heaven. And after the dream, Jacob said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Shukran believes that Melchizedek also set up this type of stone pillar in Jerusalem, just as Jacob did in Bethel. Quote, if you're going at that time to other places in the world, in Egypt, etc., Mesopotamia, you can discover temples and they were all of gold and they were filled with idols. But here it's very simple. 
rocks, stone. The stone is the house of God. You're not going to find gold and diamonds. Everything is simple. This is what God wants us to be. Simple. Ellie says it's fantastic. For what? For what reason? It's simple because this is how we're to connect with God. In the picture, you'll see uh, other items. And he says, the combination of the altar for sacrifice, the blood channel, the olive press for anointing oil, the place to tie up the sacrificial animals where they divided the sacrifice that led him, this has led him to believe that this was actually the place where Melchizedek met Abraham. I just give this to you because um, of the reference to Jacob, the stairway to heaven, the house of God. And this is just one of those discoveries. You know, this is not bragging in any way whatsoever, but come with us to Israel. Experience. We, we've done, basically now, Sharon and I have done uh, over 50 trips to Israel leading different size groups or whatsoever. We've met amazing people along the way. One is Eli Shukran. And, and again, what, as Troy says, this comes alive when you walk the land. Well, uh, again, uh, I hope you get the PDF. I hope you see those photos and those pictures. But let's move on to chapter 29. So now Abraham is set this pillar up. He's worshiped God. He said, now if you do these things for me, then I will follow you. So now we're going to see what God does for Jacob. And let me spoil it a little bit. Remember, Jacob's name's going to be changed and it's going to be changed to, you know, right? Israel. One who wrestles and struggles with God. Well, let's take a look at this wrestler in the making. But first, his uncle. Good old Uncle Laban. Chapter 29, verse 16. Laban, now that name really is synonymous with self-righteous dishonesty. Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and attractive. Jacob loved Rachel. He said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban said, it is better than I give, that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. And so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love that he had for her. Now, Leah. Leah, we're going to talk a little bit about her. I know my wife has some thoughts that I'm going to encourage you to read her comments on. But um, it says that her, uh, first of all, the Midrash states that when Rebecca bore twins, Esau, the eldest, was promised to her brother's eldest, which was Leah. And Jacob was promised to Rachel. And so here it says Leah's eyes were puffy and red and weak because of her constant crying over the prospect of having to marry Esau. But according to uh, David Friedman's commentary, he says this word weak it also can be translated as gentle or soft or delicate, which he sort of reverses it all and says, which would mean that Leah's best features were her soft, beautiful eyes. Some think that they were a light blue or a pale green. But also we have here a rare statement in the Bible a statement on romantic love. Jacob loved Rachel. He served for seven years. And it says they seemed to him but a few days for the love 
that he had for her. Uh, you know, I shared a bit in Kafir last week about that phrase and saying when Sharon and I first um, met in our community that uh, essentially the elders said, before you can date, you need to wait six months. And so uh, I, I was reminded, it wasn't seven years, but those six months seemed like only a few days because of the love that God had given me from my wife. Aww. Well, let's move on. Uh, verse 29, back to Laban. Laban gathered together all the men of the place. He made a feast. And in the evening, he took Leah, his daughter, brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave Zilpah, his servant, to his daughter Leah for a servant. And in the morning, here's that phrase, behold, it was Leah. He said to Laban, what have you done? Didn't I serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, true to his name. It's kind of karma for um, Esau. Uh, but he says, it's not done so in our place to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill the weak of this one and we will give you the other also for the service which you have served me for seven years. So Laban tricks Jacob and actual, this is interesting because if you attend a Jewish wedding today, there's a custom that's called Bedekin HaKalal, the veiling of the bride. And it actually includes a ritual where the groom lowers the veil to make sure it's his bride. And it's called Bedekin. And so again, going back to, behold, it's Leah. Can you imagine? So this is that moment where the veil is taken down and the bride says, I mean, the, the groom says, okay, that's my wife, that's Rachel, okay? <laughs> so anyhow, but this is really sort of payback for, um, the heel grabber himself as he deceived his father Isaac in relationships to uh, Esau as the firstborn. Anyhow, um, I'm running out of time. I can see here. Uh, make sure you grab Sharon's comments on this of chapter 29. Let's go to chapter 30 now, where it says that God, because God blesses Leah. And, and I must say that Leah, um, you know, if you go to the cave of Machpelah today, you're going to see the tomb of Abraham and Sarah. You'll see the tomb of Isaac and Rebekah. And you'll see the tomb of who? Jacob and, no, not Rachel. It's Jacob and Leah that's there. Interesting. So, but... Back to verse 22, chapter 30. Um, Leah has children, Rachel's barren, but God remembers Rachel and listens to her, opens her womb, and she conceives and bears a son and says, God has taken away my reproach, and she names him Joseph, saying, may Yahweh add another son to me. Now, overall, Joseph is the 11th son born out of 12. And his name literally means, may Yahweh add and give increase. And of course, as we make our way through the next few chapters, we'll get to the story of Joseph as well. Um, Andrew's got some thoughts concerning this in chapter 30, so you can take a look at that. And I'll try to lower the voice, uh, the little alert that's in the back here. So let's take a look at chapter 31 as we kind of wrap things up. Jabin, uh, Jabin, Jacob uh, heard Laban's son's words. Now this is after um, different events. Again, as I said, I don't have time to go through everything, but now we're coming up to about 20 years that uh, Jacob has served Laban. 
He's been swindled. His, his wages changed countless times or whatever. And now towards the end, verse 31, chapter 31 says that Jacob heard Laban's son's words saying, Jacob has taken everything that was our father's. He has obtained all this wealth from that which was our father's. Jacob then saw the expression on Laban's face and behold, it was not towards him as it was before. And Yahweh said to Jacob, it's time. Time to return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. Again, 20 years he served. But the most important aspect about this was the promise of God's presence that meant everything. If God were with Jacob, then he could handle anything. He could have the peace and the confidence in any difficulty. And we're gonna see what transpires because he will be tested. Chapter 31, verse 25 is the story of Laban catching up with um, Jacob and his wives. And he, you know, he's ranting and raving about all of this. And then he says that, uh, you know, why didn't you let me throw a party? Why didn't you let me bless my children, my grandchildren and all this? But the bottom line here is that then he accuses uh, Jacob of stealing his household gods. Now we know it was Rachel that took them, okay? And so in verse 32, um, Jacob unknowingly, not knowing that Rachel had them, says, anyone you find your gods with shall not live before our relatives discern what is yours with me and take it. For Jacob didn't know that Rachel had stolen them. Jacob denies the accusation and he unwittingly proclaims that the real thief would die. Unfortunately, a prophecy that was later to be fulfilled with the premature death of Rachel. Remember, Rachel is buried where? Outside of Bethlehem. Weeping for her children, for they are no more. The died in childbirth of Benjamin. That's why it's Leah that's in the cave of Machpelah. So the curse, and it unfortunately was fulfilled. Um, chapter 31, Jacob's now angry after all of this because Laban doesn't find anything. He then says, for 20 years I've been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. You changed my wages 10 times. And then these two what a group, what, what a pairing, Laban and Jacob, right? And so they decide, we gotta, you know, Laban had the power probably to do uh, harm, but God had said to, to Laban, don't touch this guy. And so we have this sort of compromise, um, setting up a pillar, may God watch over you when I'm not looking, that sort of concept. Uh, but Laban, just so you know, is, is considered to be the first enemy of Israel. He was the first person who attempted to enslave the Jewish people and thereby thwart God's redemptive plan for Israel. According to Jewish tradition, his grandson was Balaam, who later became an advisor to the Pharaoh of Egypt, who suggested the genocide of the Jewish people. Now that's Jewish legend. That's the sages. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 31, you're gonna see as we conclude here, Glenn Iverson has some comments, but in the last chapter of the week of this portion, we read that Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him and when he saw them, Jacob said, this is God's army. And he called the name of that place Mahanim. Now, this company of angels, the Jewish sages, let me quote, 
in some visible and glorious forms as they frequently appeared to the patriarchs. They were probably, probably most likely only Jacob saw them. They met him to bid him welcome to Canaan again. A more honorable reception than any princes ever met by magistrates of the city. They met him to congratulate him on his arrival and his escape from Laban. They had invisibly attended him all along, but now they appeared because he had greater dangers before him. When God designs his people for extraordinary trials, he prepares them by extraordinary comforts. I'm out of time, but the trials are just beginning for Jacob. And let me repeat once again, when God designs his people extraordinary trials, he prepares them with extraordinary comforts. Jacob saw a company of angels that had been with him. Selah. God bless you again out of time until next week as we continue our study through the Torah. May God bless you.